Lupita Manana, Chapter 7 Salvador caught hold of Lupita and carried her halfway down the ladder, where they stopped and hung, motionless. Silencio, he whispered into her ear. Lupita stopped breathing. When a loud, clanging sound announced the presence of one of the guards outside their metal car, she gasped in spite of herself. To her great relief, no one came to inspect the car. Finally, she heard the voices of the gringo guards fade, and then Salvador said, We can go down now, Lupita. They dropped, and Lupita sank in exhaustion. In a few minutes, the freight train gave a sudden lurching that flung her backward. Just as she got to her feet in the dark, a second lurch threw her over again. At last, the train started up in earnest, going slowly at first, then picking up speed. Salvador, Lupita cried softly, afraid to get up. I am here. Don't be afraid, he laughed triumphantly. Lupita understood why he was happy. They were in the United States at last, and on their way to Indio and Aunt Consuelo and Jobs. Unlike poor Senor Rosario and his family, she and Salvador had succeeded. Lupita put out her hand and touched Salvador's arm for reassurance. On and on the train went, making click-clack noises on the rails, grinding metal on metal until it came to a stop. Lupita had no idea how long they had been in the hopper, but it must have been an hour at least. She and Salvador did not move. They sat together in the darkness as their car was uncoupled, put onto a siding, and with a good deal of jerking and jolting, coupled to another train. All this work was done to the loud accompaniment of gringo voices outside. Where are we, Salvador? Lupita asked. I do not know. Perhaps in this Los Angeles Senor Rosario talked about. Then he added, Lupita, I think we are being attached to another train. Perhaps that will take us to Indio. See, si, to Indio, Lupita agreed happily. The train rolled smoothly to the east, clattering over the rails, booming warnings at automobile crossings like some great bull. After a long time, it stopped. Their car was one of the three taken off. Uncoupled, it glided noiselessly along the rails until it was brought to a halt with a terrific thump. A moment later, the second uncoupled car from the freight struck it, knocking Lupita and Salvador over on their backs. Next, they heard the sounds of the freight train's engine as it pulled out of the yards, leaving them behind. They sat in the bottom of the hopper, listening to the train's noises fade away. All about them was silence, an eerie, dead silence. Where were they? Had they come to India? We'll wait a while in here, Salvador told Lupita. Then I'll go up to the top and look around. Lupita could hear her brother's labored, quick breathing. He was as nervous as she was. After five minutes, he got up and started to search for the ladder. A soft grunt signaled that he found it. In a minute, he was back, stumbling into her. Lupita, there's nothing here but tracks and buildings and three railroad cars. There are no guards, nobody. Dawn's coming. I've seen a better place for us to hide. Hurry up. Delighted to be out of the hopper's blackness, Lupita followed him up the ladder, through the turret, and down the exterior steps to the ground. Streaks of pink and gold were showing in the east. Come on, Lupita. They went along to the car behind them. It was a box car like the one Senor Rosario and his family had entered. Suddenly, Lupita held back. Salvador grabbed her hand and spoke softly. It will be cooler in here when the sun is up, Lupita. We can see outside, and we don't have to worry that anyone will fill it with flour or grain. Lupita glanced back over her shoulder at the hopper car with horror. Ay de mi! She had not thought of that. Of course the hopper must have been brought here to be filled with something. She shivered, thinking of suffocating under so much flour, and scrambled up to the box car as fast as she could. Thirsty and still hungry after devouring what little food remained, the two of them sat in one corner of the box car until sunset. They had seen no one yet and had decided to go out after dark to find out where they were. Dusk had fallen when they suddenly heard a dog barking. The two of them froze in their corner. A dog? It went on barking. It was barking. It went on barking, but over it came a, a baritone voice singing, In the graveyard of forgetfulness, give burial to my longing. Deny that I have loved you, I ask you as a favor. Te lo pido por favor. As the man repeated the last time, Lupita realized that she knew the song. The singer must be Mexican, or a pocho. Salvador, 
whispered Lupita eagerly. Call out to him, Lupita. He will think you are a boy and don't mean him any harm. Lupita went to the side of the door of the boxcar and called, Senor, senor, por favor. Who is there? asked the man in Spanish. Lupita remembered the name Salvador had bestowed upon her in Tijuana. Eduardo Torres, senor, senor, where am I? The man asked a strange question. Who is with you? My brother Salvador, she hesitated, then asked. Are you Mexicano? No, I am Americano. He is a pocho, Lupita hissed to Salvador. Come down out of there. I work for this railroad. You are not supposed to be in there. This car is a railroad property. Ay de mi, a guard. Were pochos railroad guards too? Guardia, she cried. The man laughed and called up to her. Calm down. No, I am not the guard. Let me have a look at you. Lupita peeked carefully around the corner of the boxcar door in the, into the brown eyes of a stocky man wearing blue coveralls and a high-crowned blue cap. He was smiling while he patted a large brown dog, who was not even growling now. A quick glance showed Lupita that he had a flashlight, but no pistol. "'Where are we, senor?' she repeated. "'In Colton. Where do you want to be?' "'Indio, where our Aunt Consuelo lives.' "'Indio? That is eighty gringo miles from here, over the San Gorgonio Mountains and into the desert.' He shook his head. "'Come down now, muchachos.' "'Si,' replied Lupita, crestfallen that they were so far from their destination." but relieved by the friendliness of this pocho. After she and Salvador had gotten down, the man asked them, Did you just come up from Mexico? He chuckled. No, don't tell me. I don't want to hear you lie. I know that you did. See, we did, agreed Salvador, eyeing the dog. It had begun growling. How do we get to this Indio then, senor? The man smiled. You could take a bus from Colton to Indio if you have the money. It would cost you around three gringo dollars each. We have only pesos, Salvador said. They didn't have the equivalent of six gringo dollars in any event. Pesos are no good here, the man spoke very pleasantly. But even if you could take the bus, you don't know enough English to buy the tickets or to ask someone where to get off when you come to Indio. Surely La Migra would catch you. La Migra? Lupita asked. Si, sí, the gringo immigration officers. They hunt all the time for people like you. They look for aliens who do not have green card permits to walk over here. They are not the border police, then? Salvador asked. No, they work everywhere, not only at the border. La Migra. Lupita filed the name in her memory. First, Mexican robbers, then the fat coyote, then gringo robbers on the hillside, the border patrol, the railroad guards, and now La Migra. She looked at Salvador, and he looked at her. Señor, por favor, he asked. Tell us what road to take to Indio. We will walk there. Will you? The men of La Migra travel that road all the time in their automobiles. He grinned at Lupita. My name is Esposito, Hector Esposito. Perhaps I can find a safer way for you to get to Indio later on. You two came here to work, eh? Si, sí, senor, we did, answered Salvador. Esposito nodded. My brother owns a cafe here that serves Mexican food. He sometimes needs older boys to work for him. Beside the cafe, there's a little motel that needs workers, too. It is a pity that your brother isn't a girl. Señor Esposito, Lupita took off her baseball cap and let her braids fall down her back. I am Lupita Torres, not Eduardo, she said shyly. We come from Ensenada. I have worked there as a maid in a hotel, helping my mother. Bueno, go to my car, the blue van over there. He pointed to the west of the tracks. Get into the back and... Stay there until I finish my work here. Then I will take you to my brother's cafe. Are you hungry? At Lupita's nod, he said. There are tortillas in a metal box in my car. Eat a tortilla, but leave the other food for me. There is coffee, too, in a jug. Have some coffee, if you wish. Gracias, señor esposito, Salvador said, as he is and Lupita started toward the van. Minutes later, they were sitting inside the old blue van, eating corn tortillas and drinking coffee from the thermos. After she had eaten, Lupita immediately fell asleep on the van's floor, and a little later, Salvador nodded off too. They were awakened several hours later when Señor Esposito and his dogs climbed into the front seat. They drove through the town of Colton to an alley behind a café and motel. 
There, Esposito opened the van's rear, ordered the children out, and led them into the cafe kitchen through the back door. Rodrigo, Rodrigo, he called out. While they waited, Lupita looked about, sniffing the familiar odors of chili and peppers. The big kitchen was divided into several parts. Three cooks in white clothing worked in the big stoves, putting beans, rice, and enchiladas onto plates that dark-haired waitresses in bright red dresses picked up at a counter. They spoke to each other in Spanish. On the other side of the kitchen stood a black-haired boy about Salvador's age, scraping uneaten food off plates into big garbage pails. Then he put the soiled dishes into a square metal machine and pulled a lever, which brought hot water and hot air through the device. As Lupita looked on in wonder, dishes rapidly came out clean and dry. A short man in a ruffled white shirt, black string tie, at red sash and black trousers came out finally to look at Lupita and Salvador. Then he asked Hector in Spanish, Where did you find these two? In the customary place, Rodrigo, the freight yard. They seek work. Do they? They always seek jobs. Rodrigo Esposito had a queer, rumbling chuckle that started deep in his barrel chest. <laughs> How old are they? Salvador raised their ages. Twenty, senor, and my sister is seventeen. That cafe owner chuckled once more. <laughs> I would say fifteen and twelve, but no matter. I need some help here. Do you speak any English? No, they don't, Rodrigo, Hector Esposito replied. They are called Salvador and Lupita Torres. The girl says she has worked as a chambermaid in Mexico. Bueno, perhaps the motel can use her. This boy can work in here with the dishwashing machine. Have you told him yet what he must pay? Pay? Lupita felt stabbed. Whom did they have to pay? No, I have not told them, Hector laughed. You tell them. Your Spanish is as good as mine, brother. Just be sure to pay me my share. Adios, Rodrigo. Without another word, the pocho turned and left. The cafe owner motioned to Salvador and Lupita. Come into my office. Lupita and Salvador followed him into a small room behind the kitchen where he sat down at a desk and looked at them. In order for you to work here, you and your sister must have what is called a social security card. I can get one from you for some, from someone who forges them. Of course, this card costs money, Salvador. I will pay you $2.50 an hour. That is about 50 pesos. Lupita gasped at the amount. Salvador was very lucky. The man smiled and went on. The first week you work for me, you will pay one-third of what you earn to the man who makes your forged card. You will pay another third to my brother, Hector. A third to him? Salvador asked in astonishment. See, si, would you have got work without Hector? He surely saved you from La Migra. You and your sister can eat your meals here and rent a room for me in a house I own behind the motel. You will only have to pay $140 a month. That is very cheap here in the United States. Now, boy, you can get something to eat while I take your sister to my cousin, Senor Alfred, who owns the motel. When you have finished, tell Valentin, the boy at the dishwasher, to show you how to run the machine. Senor Rodrigo waved his hand and Salvador went out the, to the kitchen. Muchacha, you can come with me. Senor Alfred Esposito was a small boned, thin, and older than his cousin. The two men spoke in Spanish while Lupita stood by, gazing past them at the lobby filled with beautiful red vinyl covered chairs and tile black tile top black iron table tables. Suddenly, Senor Alfred asked her, Where did you work in Mexico? In Ensenada, Senor, at the hotel of Senor Aguilar, before where my mother works. I helped her clean and make beds for gringo tourists. So? Senor Alfred addressed the cafe owner. I guess I have a uniform small enough for this girl. He turned to Lupita. One thing, muchacha. Do not expect to enjoy an afternoon siesta here as you do in Mexico. We work all day until six o'clock. He spoke to Senor Rodrigo again. I'll pay two dollars and twenty-five cents an hour and put Concha in charge of her. My mother taught me the words sheet and towel and soap, Senor, Lupita volunteered. Si, sí, he replied disinterestedly. Then he asked the cafe owner, Has she been told of the forged card? <laughs>